Welcome everyone to my virtual presentation on Exciton Transport in Two-Dimensional Periscopes. My name is Michael Seitz and I'm a PhD student at the Autonomous University of Madrid. And today I would like to shed some more light on how excitons move through two-dimensional periscopes. Metal halide periscopes are made up of three main components. A metal, a halide, as well as a small cation. And in recent years, periscopes have shown a tremendous potential for lightweight, solution processable, low cost, and highly efficient electronics, with the most prominent example being periscite solar cells, which reach very high efficiencies in a very short amount of time. While periscites have an incredible amount of positive properties, one of their biggest drawbacks is their chemical stability, as periscites tend to degrade readily when exposed to ambient conditions. However, by introducing larger organic cations, it is also possible to form these 2D periscites, which have shown to have a better chemical stability. In these 2D periscites, electron hole pairs, so called excitons, dominate their optoelectronic properties rather than free charge carriers like in their bulk counterparts. And the dynamics of these excitons is not yet well understood. For example, we don't know how fast and far excitons travel in these materials, which is an important piece of information when making efficient periscite solar cells. In the coming minutes, I would like to provide you with some more insights on the exciton dynamics and address the following two questions. First of all, how do excitons move through 2D periscites? And secondly, how can we control it by changing their chemical composition? We grow our 2D periscites from a saturated precursor solution, which allows us to get these nicely luminescent single crystals with sizes of up to several hundreds of micrometers and even millimeters. After we grow them, we exfoliate them and obtain single crystalline flakes with a nicely flat surface for inspection. To measure exciton transport, we use transient photoluminescence microscopy, which is a technique that is on the rise for visualizing excited state transport. For these measurements, we start off with the nice and single crystalline flakes that we just obtained, in our case with phenethyl ammonium lead iodine, and we excite a narrow exciton population with a near diffraction limited laser pulse. After these excitons are generated, they start diffusing outwards over time, which also yields a broader and broader exciton population. Now we are able to measure this time-dependent broadening by measuring the fluorescent emission from this exciton distribution, which is proportional to the exciton density at the fluences that we use. We do this by using a scanning avalanche photodiode, which gives us the spatial resolution through the scanning and the time resolution by the photo counting of the avalanche photodiode. We can see that at early times, we have a very narrow distribution of excitons that we have just created with our laser pulse. As time goes by, excitons start diffusing outwards and the distribution becomes broader and broader as time goes by. We can quantify this broadening by extracting the mean square displacement of the distribution, which is just the square of the standard deviation minus the square of the standard deviation at time zero. In doing so, we obtain this graph here. Now diffusion theory tells us that the slope of this curve is proportional to the diffusivity of the excitons. And for constant slope, we have normal diffusion, meaning that excitons simply travel through the material by a random walk. Now fitting the data at early times, we are able to extract a diffusivity of around 0.2 cm squares per second. I know it's hard to imagine how fast this really is, but in other words, excitons travel around 200 to 300 nanometers in only one nanosecond which is comparable to the speed of a commercial aircraft. Some of you might be more familiar with the term of mobility. However, mobility and diffusivity are just related through the thermal energy. Now we see this linear increase for early times. However, as time goes by, we observe a slowdown of the broadening, where we see a subdiffusive behavior where the broadening slows down as time goes by. And this can be characterized by the diffusion exponent alpha. For alpha equals 1, we are in the normal diffusion regime, like in at early times, and as alpha decreases, the diffusion becomes more and more subdiffusive. One of the origins of subdiffusion is the presence of trap states that slow down excitons as they get trapped over time. For periscites, it has been suggested that these traps can be filled under illumination. The picture suggests that excitons generated from the background illumination are able to fill the traps, allowing other excitons to diffuse more readily throughout the material. To test this hypothesis, we perform transient photoluminescence microscopy with different background illumination intensities. 
Here you can see again the result without any background illumination. You can again see a linear regime in the beginning and a clear subdiffusive regime for later times. Now when applying a background illumination, we indeed see that the subdiffusive part becomes less pronounced and even vanishes for high enough fluences. You can see that also by looking at the alpha parameter that approaches one for high enough fluences. On the other hand, we don't observe any change in diffusivity at early times, no matter the background illumination intensity. And this suggests that the early times are unaffected by trapping sites. One very interesting thing to highlight is that the intensity used, where we don't see any influence of the traps, is equivalent to only around two suns of illumination intensity, which indicates that trap state filling is very efficient in 2D perovskites. I would like to emphasize that the early times are unaffected by trapping sites, which allows us to extract material properties that are independent from trapping sites, which we are now going to use to compare perovskites of different chemical compositions. For that, let's have now a look at the two most commonly used organic spacers, phenethylammonium, which we just studied, and butylammonium. Here is again the result for phenethylammonium, where you can see a very clear and fast diffusion outwards of excitons. However, when we measured butylammonium, we observed a stunning difference. We could barely see any diffusion outwards for butylammonium. Evaluating the data, one can see that excitons do diffuse, again showing a linear and sublinear regime, but the diffusion is clearly much slower as compared to phenethylammonium, which is again shown here with the green line. Strikingly, there is an order of magnitude difference between the two. And this also translates into a significantly shorter diffusion length, which is a very important parameter for applications. For example, for solar cell, it is really beneficial to have long diffusion length to being able to extract the excitons that are generated by the absorbed light. Seeing such a big difference is especially surprising as organic spacers normally don't change the optoelectronic properties of perovskites too much and raises the question, where does this big difference come from? One explanation could be the exciton phonon interactions. And indeed, recently studies in both 2D and 3D perovskites have suggested that electron phonon interactions are extremely important in perovskites. This is due to the rather soft ionic lattice which allows the ions to strongly vibrate and phonons to play a crucial role. Recently, Gong et al. found that the atomic displacement is a good measure for the coupling strength of excitons and phonons. The atomic displacement tells us how far an atom in the crystal lattice vibrates around its equilibrium position. So let's have a look by plotting the diffusivity of our perovskites as a function of the average atomic displacement for each unit cell. We have phenethyl ammonium with a low atomic displacement and a high diffusivity, and butyl ammonium with a high atomic displacement and supposedly strong exciton phonon interactions and a low diffusivity. So this follows the expected trend that with higher exciton phonon interaction we have more scattering and therefore a lower diffusivity. Intuitively it also makes sense that the atoms in phenethyl ammonium lead ion perovskites move less, as the phenethyl ammonium is a bigger and bulkier molecule that makes the crystal lattice overall more rigid as compared to the small and tiny butyl ammonium molecule. Now, of course, these are only two data points, which is not enough to confirm a trend. So we did more measurements on other organic spacers as well. And what we see is that all of them follow the same trend of slower diffusion with higher atomic displacement. In conclusion, I hope I was able to show you that excitons travel rather quickly through 2D perovskites until they encounter trapping sites which lead to subdiffusion. Also, the choice of the organic spacer can have dramatic impact on the transport properties and can yield diffusion length that can differ by an order of magnitude. This finding is extremely important as the diffusion length is one of the key parameters when designing devices such as solar cells. Additionally, the structural rigidity seems to govern the exciton transport and suggests that exciton phonon coupling is the dominant scattering term. The atomic displacement parameter can be used as a new design parameter when choosing the perovskite material for devices, as it can be readily extracted from single crystal XRD data. Recently, it has also been suggested that exciton phonon coupling is so strong such that we have to account for exciton polarons. Our results are consistent with the formation of large polarons, but don't allow a clear conclusion whether they are present or not in 2D perovskites. If you want to learn more about our results, please have a look at our recent publication in Nature Communications. With this, I would like to thank all the contributors to this project, as well as all the funding sources. 
and thank you for your interest in this topic.